couple years ago, my family, we were on like a mini vacation. We were up north in Port St. Lucie, and we're cruising in the minivan. We're going to this place called Pop Stroke. We're going to eat lunch and play some mini golf, and we're on this back road. I mean, it's a two-lane road, and coming from Miami-Dade, it just felt like we were in the middle of nowhere. Now, I don't know the area very well, but there's just land and fields and pastures as far as the eye can see. Anyway, well, I'm driving down this two-lane road, and I notice up ahead that there's something, there's some kind of debris in the road, and so I, I swerve to try to go around it to the right to avoid the debris, and when I do, I heard a thoop, and soon that nasty air pressure light, that yellow-orange light on the dash, and then you hear that terrible sound, you know, that flat tire sound, and so I pull off to the side of the road, and sure enough, flat tire. And I look around, and I'm going, where are we? There is nothing around. Now, here's what I know. Is there ever a good time for a flat tire? <laughs> the answer is no. So here's an important question. What do you do when things don't go according to your plan? I mean, when you're like, yeah, this is just not it. This is not how I, I drew it up. This is not the plan. This is not how it's supposed to be. Things are off the rails. Now, a flat tire, that's one thing. That's inconvenient. It's never a good time. But, but what about more serious stuff? Like, you know, Greg, I just thought I'd be married by now. Or, or Greg, I took this job, and they made me all of these promises, and now I'm just miserable. Or Greg, my kids, they're just having a hard time in school and it's harder than I thought and I don't know what to do. Or Greg, we're, my wife and I, we're just, we're just arguing, we're fighting all the time. Or Greg, my, my mom is sick and they're running all this test and it just looks like cancer. It's not how it's supposed to be. I mean, this is not the plan. This, this, this is not it. And, and, and so many times what starts with hope and with passion and excitement, what, what starts with our tank full and full of life and excitement somehow ends up empty on E. And when that happens to you and me, the, the natural, the normal response, when, when your plans go off the rails, when things don't go according to your plan, the natural normal thing is to look to the heavens and ask, God, God, are you there? I mean, do you see what's happening here? Or, or, or maybe even to point a finger and go, how could you? In fact, this here is one of the top reasons that people leave, that people leave the church or, or walk away from God or unfollow Jesus. This idea, God didn't deliver. I mean, he didn't meet my expectations. And for many who walk away from faith, right, they had a very specific idea of what God should do in their lives. But guess what? He didn't deliver. He didn't deliver on this prayer, this specific prayer. He didn't deliver on this need, this specific felt need. And he did not deliver. And things did not go according to plan. And, and it's like, well, how can you believe in him? I mean, how can you trust how, I mean, how can you trust God, a, a God when there, there's just so much evil and there's so much hate? And Greg, there's just so much pain and loss and hurt. If you've ever felt like your life is just falling apart or off the tracks, if you ever wonder where God is, this story is for you. It's found in Ruth chapter 1, beginning verse 1. The writer says there was a time when Israel didn't have kings to rule over them, but they had leaders to help them. And this story, this is a story about some things that happened during that time. There wasn't enough food in the land of, of Judah, so a man went to live for a while in a country called Moab, and he's from Bethlehem. His wife and two sons with, went with him. The man's name, look, Elimelech. His wife's name's Naomi, two sons, Malon and Kilian. Two sons, Malon and Kilian, okay? Again, this is all context. They're from the tribe of Ephraim. They had a home, uh, had been in Bethlehem. Take note of that. And they went to Moab and lived there. 
Now, the, the writer's giving you some context. This is in the, the Old Testament, the first part of the Bible, the, the Jewish scriptures. And they're from the nation of Israel, which is God's chosen people. And there's, this is before the kings, before King Saul or King David. This was actually a period called the period of the judges. It was about 350 years, and it was just really full of chaos. The writer gives you context. There's the husband, there's the wife, and there are the two sons. And he tells us there is a famine. And now notice, there's a key city. If you know anything about the, the Bible, this is the key city called Bethlehem. And they leave Bethlehem and they go to a place, to a country called Moab, which is really enemy territory. Now the story after the introduction takes this crazy turn. He says, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, died so she was left with only her two sons. The two sons married women from Moab. One was named Orpha. The other was named Ruth. And Naomi's family lived in Moab, what, 10 years. But look what happens. Malon, Killian, the sons died. So she's left without her sons and her husband. Now the story turns into a tragedy. Her life falls apart. It's off the rails. Her husband is dead. She's a widow. And then she loses not one, but two sons. And now we actually have three widows. Husband dead, sons dead, three widows. Now, anyway, you look at this, this is not good. Naomi is in a really bad place. You remember the last time you were just in a bad place? You know, this is, since it's not the plan. I mean, this is not how it's supposed to go. Now, the story continues in Ruth. This is Naomi's story. As her, word, as her world falls apart, goes off the rails, she hears that back in her home country, the famine is over, and so she prepares to go back to Bethlehem. She has these two daughter-in-laws, Orpha and Ruth, and she tells the daughter-in-laws, go home. Thank you for everything. You've been amazing, but go home. Start over. And to make a longer story short, Orpha leaves, but Ruth, she says, no, I will not leave you. This is kind of a side note here. Have you ever noticed that God sends people into our lives at just the right time? And, and usually at that time, we can't see it. We don't have eyes to see it, or we don't always know it in the moment. And many times it's in hindsight. You look back and go, oh, yeah, man. And God sends people into our lives to help us, to encourage us at just the right time. And Ruth is that person for Naomi. Now, fast forward the story a little bit. We pick up in verse 19. It says the two women, that's Ruth and Naomi, they continued on their way. And as they arrived in Bethlehem, the, the whole town was stirred up because of them. And the women in the town asked, can that possibly be Naomi? This is kind of that idea like, oh my goodness, that Naomi, she doesn't look good. The years have been unkind to her. The pain, the despair, the loss is evident on her face. And Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara. The mighty one has made my life very bitter. Now, the name Naomi means sweetness. He says, don't call me sweetness. Call me Mara. And the name Mara actually means bitter. It could literally be translated, I'm miserable. Look what she says. I was full when I went away, but the Lord has brought me back empty. So why are you calling me Naomi sweet? The Lord has made me suffer. The mighty one has brought trouble on me. The, the almighty has made my life bitter. He's made me suffer. He has brought me trouble. I was full, but now I'm empty. You, you ever noticed? Like, why is it so easy for us to become bitter? I mean, to become cynical, to, to become resentful. I mean, your dreams, your, your plans, your expectations. You, you dreamed of a life full of relational blessings, and instead you got relational brokenness. I mean, you thought that, that you were taking your dream job and, and that this is it. And, and you're, you're going to keep getting promoted and make a lot of money and get that house you want and that car you want and live that dream. And instead, it's a nightmare and it's a boss from hell. This is not what I signed up for. This was not the plan. 
I mean, I mean, you wanted to live a life full of meaning and purpose, and instead you're experiencing pain and loss. If you look closely at the story, one of the principles you see in Naomi's story is this. A distorted view of God always leads to a distorted view of life. And, and Naomi, she's, she's, she goes to, no, to, to Moab, and it's not where she should be. Now, there's a lot of cultural stuff going on, but maybe the best way I could describe this is it's kind of like an alcoholic hanging out at a bar. It's just not where you should be. And she spent 10 years in Moab. That's a decade, not where she was supposed to be. And in her pain and in her loss, she began to lose sight. She, she's lost perspective. I'm reminded of the words of the Apostle Paul in a letter he wrote to the church at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 13, he says this. He says, now we see like a dim likeness this thing. It's as if we're, we're seeing them in a foggy mirror. But he says, someday we'll see, see clearly. Someday we'll be face to face. But what I know now is not complete. Someday I will know completely, just as God knows me completely. He's like, like now it's like dim. It's foggy. It's blurry. I don't have the full picture. I don't know the full story. But one day, there will be face-to-face. Now, today, right now, it's not complete. I can't see it. But one day, someday, I'll know. I'll see the full picture. And here's Naomi. And in her pain, and in her loss, and in her bitterness... It is very blurry, and it is very distorted, and she is doing the natural, normal thing. She is pointing her finger at God and lashing out at God and and blaming God. God, God, are you there? Do do you see what's going on around here? Like, Like, how could you? You did not deliver. You did not keep your end of the deal. God made my life bitter. God let me down. God didn't do what he should have done. Is there something blurry right now for you in your life? And here's Naomi. She, she lost sight. And she pointed her finger and she blamed God. But what's interesting, if you look real close, she did one very interesting thing. Look closely at at Ruth 1, verse 20. She says, don't call me Naomi, sweetness. Call me Mara, bitter. Look what she says. The mighty one has made my life very bitter. She called God by a very specific name. Kind of a side note. What you call God reflects how well you know him, right? Big guy in the sky, the man upstairs, the higher power, savior, redeemer, my anchor, my rock, my comfort, heavenly father. Well, here, this was written in Hebrew, and this this Hebrew name, when it's translated into English, it's translated like mighty one or almighty, but the Hebrew was this idea of El Shaddai, El Shaddai. And the literal meaning for that is ample or enough, ample or enough. And the the literal kind of translation would be, God is exactly what you need when you need him. Now, the story, if you fast forward, Naomi's daughter-in-law, Ruth, she waited patiently. She trusted. She had deep faith. She never gave up hope. She didn't settle. And there's all of this kind of crazy cultural stuff that happens. But in Ruth 4, verse 13, the, the writer says that Boaz married Ruth. Then he slept with her, and the Lord blessed her so that she became pregnant and she had a son. 14, the women said to Naomi, we praise the Lord today. He has provided a family protector for you. May this child become famous all over Israel. He will make your life new again. He will take care of you when you are old. He is the son of your very own daughter-in-law. She loves you. She's better than you than seven sons. Verse 16, says Naomi took the child in her arms. And she took care of him. And the women living there said, Naomi has a son. And they named him Obed. And he was the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of David. Now, brokenness turns to hope. And not just for you, but 
for everyone. I don't know if you've ever read Matthew chapter 1, and there's this list of names. Why? Why are those names there? Well, this gives us just a glimpse. See, Boaz was the father of Obed, and Obed was the father of Jesse, and Jesse was the father of David. And then you go 14 generations, and another 14 generations, you come to verse 16. Jacob was the father of Joseph. Joseph was the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who's called the Messiah. Hey, Naomi, (laughs) your brokenness, your pain was turned to hope, not just for you, but for everyone. And out of her pain, and out of her loss, and out of her brokenness, and out of her bitterness, God brought hope and healing and wholeness and restoration, not just for Naomi, but for you and for me. And here's the thing. There is. There will be pain. You, you're going to experience pain. You're going to experience trouble. You're going to experience loss and brokenness. Your plans will not go according to your plan. And in your life, There are going to be seasons, there's going to be times when you're going to go from full to empty. And we all come to times, to moments, when we must decide. And one way leads to bitterness, and we become cynical and mad and resentful, and we can get mad at God and mad at the church and just mad at everything. And you see a lot of grumpy old people with not much hope and not much faith, and they're just old and bitter and fragile and grumpy, and I just don't like being around them. Or you can choose a different path, and you can choose hope. You can choose faith. You can choose to believe. You can choose to trust. You can choose to know. Going, It's still painful. It's still brokenness, but I just don't know. I don't see completely. I don't know the full story. I'm just going to choose to believe and trust that God is exactly what I need when I need him. Pain is inevitable, but misery is optional. See, God understands you. He understands our world. He knows how brutal it is. He he knows how awful and broken humans are. He sees how violent and mean we can be toward one another, toward ourselves. And he sees our cruelty. And without God's intervention into the narrative of the human story, life would just be flat out nasty and brutish and short. But instead of letting your and my inhumanity be the final word, God entered the mess in the form of, in the form of a human. And in flesh and blood through Jesus, he conquered all of that bitterness with love. And we threw the worst of humanity directly at Jesus. Hatred, abuse, ridicule, ridicule, rejection, even death. And God turned it into life. And not just life for himself, but life for us, for you, for me, for humanity, for for the very people who killed Jesus. See, the, the bitter cynics thought they were winning on the last Thursday of Jesus' life. They were certain they had the final word on Friday, what we call Good Friday. They were were in control. Despair had won. Let bitterness reign. I mean, even Jesus' closest followers, his disciples, they even thought it was over. They went home. They went back to their life. They went back to fishing. But nobody, I mean nobody saw Sunday coming. Nobody saw hope rising. No one saw love breaking from the ashes of hate. Nobody saw Jesus coming back. And here's the remarkable part of of following Jesus. This is what's amazing about putting your faith and belief in Jesus. It's not that we just have a Savior who can deliver us. It's that we have a Savior who sees us for who we really are, and He loves us anyway. See, Jesus stared hate in the face and he met it with love. Jesus confronted despair and he made it abundantly clear it wouldn't win. See, the the whole idea of the gospel, the thrust of the gospel, the good news of Jesus is that Jesus sees your hate and he meets it with love. He sees your pain, your despair, your bitterness, and he counters it with hope. He sees your doubt and he lobs belief back at you over and over again. See, bitterness 
it melts under the relentless hope of the gospel. Bitterness cannot linger under the relentless assault of love. See, hope cannot die if Jesus is really alive. See, Jesus, <laughs> he kicked bitterness in the teeth. And you and I can too through the power of Jesus. Hope is not dead. And this is the invitation for you and for me today. See, we can receive hope today. See, pain, it's inevitable. You're going to have trouble. You are going to experience pain. You're going to experience loss. It's going to happen. But misery, bitterness, that's an option. That's optional. That's a choice. God, I thank you for the, for the message of Naomi. And she experienced so much pain. God, her story is a story of tragedy, but it doesn't stay a story of tragedy. It's a story of tragedy that turns into triumph because of you. And God, right now, there are people listening to my voice. There's people listening, watching right now who are in a season of pain who are in a season of loss. And God, the natural, normal thing to do is to point our finger at the heavens and, and blame you. But God, I pray that you would open our eyes because maybe there's more going on here than we can see. God, maybe you're writing a story that we just can't wrap our brains around and we don't have perspective on. God, because of Jesus, we can cling to hope. We can cling to faith. We can cling to you. So God, may your power, may your, may your love, may your grace, your compassion, may it just fall on us today, God. And may, and may we be, be bearers of hope because of you and what you've done. And we love you. And we pray this boldly in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, we're now going to transition into our time of communion. And each Sunday here at Miami Church, we take time out to, to both remember and to celebrate the sacrifice that Jesus made when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. We take a small cracker and a cup of juice as he instructed. And we share that as a community, um, as a time together. So let's go ahead. Let's remember and let's celebrate what Jesus did for us.